This is Ben Modell, silent film accompanist and historian, with Dave Lefkowitz on Dave's Gone By here on UNC Radio. Welcome back to Dave's Gone By, and this is going to be a really fun, nostalgic piece for me to do this this upcoming interview here with Ben Modell. I'll tell you why. First of all, I'm an NYU graduate, so many, many years ago I got a bachelor's there in film and TV, and I got a master's there in dramatic writing, and Ben was there at the very same time I was there, taking a lot of the same classes and loving the same things, because the other reason this is so nostalgic for me is since I was a child watching public television, WNET Channel 13, back in, oh, I guess it would have been the 70s, early 70s, and they would show silent movies on TV. If you, if you can imagine television, which now has 500 channels and doesn't show anything, back then you could tune in sometimes on Channel 13 and see Chaplin and Buster Keaton and the Keystone Cops, and then they had the Long Cheneys and the longer films, and just being enamored and entranced by that whole era and falling in love with silent film, which essentially was one of the reasons I went to NYU for film. So I had that experience, and then someone else who had something, I guess, very, very similar, and then went on to make it a huge part of his life is Ben Modell. He helps preserve silent films. He's a historian about the art form and he works as an accompanist. He'll sit there and play the piano and do the scores to these movies when they're played live or sometimes when they're released on DVD. So it's, it really is quite exciting for me to talk with Ben Modell. Ben, how are you doing? I'm, I'm all right, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Oh, yeah, an absolute pleasure. So, so let's get right to our college days, as it were. When were you at NYU, and was your degree cinema studies, or was it film and TV? I was a film production major. Uh, I was there, I graduated in 84. In the same way, I'd grown up watching silent movies on television, on, on public television, and as well at the home of Walter Kerr, who wrote a book called The Silent Clowns. And he was the drama critic for the New York Times. The book had come out in 75. But my folks remember that hearing somewhere that he had, he lived in our town and had a large collection of 16 millimeter film. And I wrote him a letter when I was 12 and he called me a few days later. And I said, you know, uh, I would love to see more silent films. And he would call me and said he'd be happy to have me over and show me movies. Oh, my God, yeah. And the Kerr family lived uh, right on the water in a giant house. It's, it's the house that Gene Kerr wrote uh, about in Please Don't Eat the Daisies. Right. And so I went into this house, and back in the, his uh, Walter Kerr study, you know, he had theater seats from a theater that uh, had, I guess, closed up, a regular theater, and his wife, Jean, had bought these theater seats and had 60-millimeter projectors and a reel-to-reel -reel tape deck of... Uh, Accompanying music. Scores, you know, that, that he had cobbled together from instrumental re records. Which he would sit in the back of the room smoking cigars and playing the tapes uh, and calling out things of interest here and there. Oh, this, that's where he broke, Keaton broke his neck or stuff like that. Um, but I, so I got through high school having seen everything kind of already. Uh, he had access to or owned prints of things that were not necessarily available from Blackhawk films. Oh yes, Blackhawk! Oh my god! Yeah. I, I forgot uh, even to mention, uh, I used to send away. I, I, we, I, I got the catalog, and I'd save up my pennies, and yeah. usually it was 8 to $12. You would get like a one or two reel film of the great... Uh, it, it was yeah. great, and Blackhawk had been around since the, the, the 40s. Somebody sells a t-shirt with the Blackhawk logo on it. I mean, it's licensed and approved and everything, but you can get Blackhawk t-shirts for Blackhawk films. So that was, you know, there was the stuff you get from Blackhawk, and then there was the stuff that if you knew people who knew people, things got printed in 16 millimeter. I remember vividly one time that I got a call from uh, Mr. Curry who said, oh, I have uh, Bill Everson's print of three ages uh, right now, but I have to give it back to him Tuesday. Can you come over? It was like two, just a couple days notice. I was like, yeah, because who? There was no way to see Three Ages. Three Ages was a Keaton film, right? The right? Keaton first film. It's, it's Three Ages, not The Three Ages, as it's often referred to. It's just Three Ages. But um, stuff like that would happen. Um, 
I was a filmmaker as well. I was a super eight filmmaker, like a lot of people were in the 70s. Right. When I went to film school at NYU. But how I got started playing for films is that you probably remember that there was a basic film history class that you had to take the first semester of silence, second semester of sound. Mm -hmm. And back in the days of 16 millimeter, the films were shown in silence because the films, the prints were double perf and didn't have tracks on them. And they were just shown silent. And it bothered me that these films were bombing in front of film students week after week. Because it's tough. I mean, it's, it's one thing to watch a five to ten minute one reeler of uh, Chaplin or the Keystone Cops or you know, Mary Pickford, whatever it is. Because then it's not so... But if they're trying to watch a movie that's longer than about yeah, ten or fifteen minutes, and then they would show... I agreed with, no, with just the sound of film students snoring. It's, it's not... Yeah, not that great, and and even the short films really benefit from from some kind of music. It's just it's harder to concentrate without it there. So um, I went to the head of the department at the time, a guy named Brian Winston, and told him what I was I wanted to try play for films. He's very enthusiastic, and I started doing it. This is my sophomore year in the fall, and it just sort of took off. Word got around, and then Charles Silver at the Museum of Modern Arts Film Study Center somehow heard about me and uh, was teaching a, a class in, in Bridgeport University back when they had a very good film department in, in that following spring. And so I would go out with him and play for that class. And the, I think also that semester and then the next two years, I wound up playing for Bill Everson's class. Wow. Which was great because, you know, between the fact that he talked less and showed more film than most film uh, teachers did. Uh, and the fact that he had, you know, his own collection, he had a lot of stuff that just wasn't around. So here I was, 20 years old, uh, getting to see stuff that I only heard of. So I'd preview the prints, and I remember going to the office at Cinema Studies once, and, and there's a note taped to the can. Dear Ben, this is the only extant print. Please be very careful. So it was his codoscope of our parents' people, which... I, other prints have since turned up, but that, at the time, that was it. And so it was a great opportunity. I thought of it as a, a silent film accompaniment boot camp because I was playing two or three classes you know, and features a week. Uh, I, at the time, also, I met what I, what I call the, the third of my three silent film godfathers, who's Lee Irwin. Hmm. You remember the Carnegie Hall Cinema, which is now Zankel Hall, which is a giant concert hall around the corner from Carnegie Hall. It was, at the time, a repertory cinema with a Wurlitzer organ in it, and the organist was Lee Irwin. Oh. He had been playing for silent movies in the 20s himself, and I went there to... I went around trying to meet as many of the people who were accompanying films in the city as I could, and I met Stuart Oderman and uh, Bill Perry, who I'd heard for years in public television, and uh, Lee became a friend and a mentor and answered questions, and we would hang out, and you know, I just knew him for many years until he yeah. passed away in the year 2000 and uh, that's where uh, I got my knowledge of what works, what doesn't work, what to play, what not to play, how to play for scenes. Like with Mr. Kerr and Bill Everson, Lee was a link to the silent film era. I mean, he was there and so that meant a lot to me as well. I'm curious about the whole methodology of playing for silent films. You don't sit there and write out a score as Chaplin did for, for City Lights. I mean, do you have certain cues and then there's happy music, sad music? Yeah. I mean, how, how much is improv, how much is studied, is written? Yeah. It depends on how much time you have. I, I, I certainly planned more earlier on, and I still try to plan as much as I can if I can, but it's largely improvised. And it's gotten easier and easier over the years to improvise because I've developed and I'm continuing to develop and augment the, you know, a musical language and vocabulary, which it, it kind of works the way jazz might in that sense. So you're improvising, but you're not winging it by any means. The ideal situation is to preview a film so you can anticipate and stay ahead of the film. One of Lee's big watchwords was to try mm -hmm. or to avoid doing certain things that would call attention to the fact that somebody was in the room playing the music, which is an odd initiative for a <laughs> for an artist. big musician yeah. composer where you know you might really want to be taken credit taken for your work where really the ultimate goal with a film accompaniment is to disappear and Lee always said the best compliment you can get after a show is I forgot you were playing that's right because and, you don't want to play 
a melody that people know because they'll get distracted yeah. and, and, and also you want to be with the film rather than anticipating what's going on and, you know it's a subtle thing it really is really it really is and anticipating it by a little bit is okay but being late on stuff hmm. is what you would want to try to avoid and, and especially if there's a film where there's a specific piece of music that somebody puts on a control and plays there's a shot of a label you want to try and find that or if there's something that does really fit like uh, the, in Steamboat Bill Jr. the Prisoner song which Buster Keaton sings is a real song and it was actually a huge hit believe it or not in 1925 for a guy named Vernon Dahlhart and as a record everybody had people knew it so that was part of the joke of that but it, you have to play the Prisoner's song in, in the show in, in, I remember playing for Greed and there's a hymn Nearer My God to Thee that's used a couple times and so you have to get the music for that and you play it but doing things like sound effects and what I call song title puns which is a convention that you know, you're familiar with Warner Brothers cartoons, which was done a great deal. And it was something that was historically accurate to film scoring in the 20s, but it, it uh, doesn't, uh, it has a different resonance today. All it does is tell the audience, oh, look, the pianist is being very clever. Yeah. No, I never liked, the, I think they did one series of silent films that they show on TV, silent comedies, that they had actual sound effects along with the music. I never thought that worked. I never yeah. liked hearing the gunshot or the boing or the, the actual sound when somebody hits somebody with a mallet. But boom! Yeah, it's a tradition that comes out of out of vaudeville and the circus. But the the thing is, at the time, it it may you know in the '30s or even in the '20s, and it was done. It was still something relevant. But an audience of today associates that with fairy tunes and and, and things like that. So it means less. Hmm. People used to have a much more emotional connection to music and popular songs. So if there's a scene in a movie, a young man going off to war, and you, you play a song about mother and, or something like that, people would get misty. But now if you do that, it just sounds corny. So while it's historically accurate, it's, it's the one place where you, and this is a choice you make. There are some accompanists out there who deliberately do those sort of things because it's historically accurate. I think that as a, a companist today, you you know you're working as a, br a cultural bridge over 90 years, and you're trying to stay true to the film's intent and emotion and impact as intended by the people who made it, while at the same time acknowledging that 60, 70 years of film music have happened, hmm. and that a contemporary audience has a certain knowledge base and a certain different reaction to hearing a certain kind of musical accompaniment. You have to sort of um, straddle the two things and make the right choices so that people today get the same reaction from the film that the people who made it would want them to. We're talking with Ben Modell here. He's a silent film historian and preservationist and accompanist. When you're playing for a slapstick film, do you, let's say someone falls down in a Max Senate comedy, yeah. do you do a little run on the piano? Do you? Absolutely not. No, you don't Absolutely do that. Not. Again, that's the thing that, that it's just like I might as well be waving my hand at the audience and saying, look what I did. For me, that's a no-no. There, there are a couple of guys out there who do that sort of thing. This is my own sensibilities. That, um, and I think that between becoming familiar with the way we work, I think for me, having come into this as a filmmaker and not a, primarily a musician or, prim or yeah. a conservatory a musician or whatever, my initiative is, is to respect the work of the filmmakers and to not put in jokes that weren't there or just take away from the work that's on the screen. Doing sound effects, you know, smacking the keys when somebody falls is sticky to me. Okay. And so I, I personally do not do that. Do you prefer playing for comedies or dramas? I prefer playing to anything. Ah, okay. People always ask, well, what do you like to play for? And I always say, well, what do you, what do you want to show your audience? You refer to me as a, a preservationist, and it, I think of myself as a... I'm more interested in a film exhibition, although mm. calling myself an exhibitionist doesn't really <laughs> work. Uh, so I think that, well, you know, but my, my initiative is, is how can we show more film? So it's a matter of preserving the audience through exhibiting the film. This is, you know, a part of preservation that doesn't get talked about a lot, but showing films is very important. And, and there's a series I do uh, that I also co-curate at MoMA called Cruel and Unusual Comedy, and we do this once a year, and we showcase rare comedy shorts that were preserved uh, mainly in the 
70s and 80s by Eileen Bowser when she was the head of the department. Mm. She introduced one of our, our one of our programs a year or two ago, and what she said I think is very important. She said that uh, preservation isn't complete until it's shown to an audience. So uh, as far as what I'd like to play for, it really it really depends. You know, if I'm going out to the Champlain Valley Film Society where they've only you know, in this whole area, they've only done a silent film one or two times, I'm going to stick to doing comedies. Because uh, it's an easy draw for a somewhat novice audience to show Safety Laughter, Steamboat right. Bill, or whatever, or The Mark of Sorrow. But if um, you're at MoMA or something like that, you'll, you'll whip out something from D.W. Griffith or maybe something... Do you do foreign also? Do you, I do, do every, you know, everything. I mean, at, at MoMA, I, I play for what they tell me they're showing in a uh, department of, of curators who different, do different series. So what's, what's neat is that I get to do a wide variety of things. Uh, this, this summer, actually, in two completely separate venues, I've done several films made in France by Russian emigres. Whoa. Happened to work out there was a series at Bard Summerscape at Bard College where I played five or six of those films and then I just got back from a weekend of shows at the National Gallery of Art where they were showing also the same sort of film. So whatever you're showing, there's not like a thing where I'll, I don't play for that sort of film or I'm really sick of the general, do you have anything else? Because <laughs> for me, the it's the audience, you know. I did a show in the spring at the AFI Theater in Silver Spring, Maryland, a packed theater during the daytime of third and fifth graders for the general. Mm. And it was shown off a DVD, not really the best DVD that was available, it's what they were able to get their hands on, but these, these little kids didn't know that it wasn't off the camera negative, and they'd never experienced this before, and they were just, they had such a great time. It was just so exciting. So for me, it's uh, trying to fit fit a program to the audience, and uh, and sometimes it's just a matter of, oh, here's something really cool that you don't know about that you I know you're going to like, and if there's a, a situation in a venue where we've built up an audience and I can program something, and I know people will come anyway, they'll get to see something. Like uh, last Friday, I was at the, the Packard Campus Theater at the Library of Congress in Culpeper, Virginia, and... Rob Stone, my friend, who's a film curator there, and also programs a series. And what do you what do you want to play to? And like that's um, uh, my I immediately went to well, what can I show people? Well, I thought, well, I know the Library of Congress has a print of a film called Paths to Paradise with Raymond Griffith, who is hmm. one of the greatest silent film comedians you never heard of. Right. Yeah. Um, so I said, well, let's show Paths to Paradise. And we had like 115 people came, and they had a great time. And now we have all these Raymond Griffith fans. So part of what I do is, is I'm a programmer as well. In some ways, the luckiest part, because you become a tastemaker. You become the guy who selects what goes on the DVD and what uh, people who haven't been particularly exposed to these things get to see. What, what would be your favorite one or two silent films of all time, long or short? Um, well, Modern Times is probably one of my Mm. My favorite. One. Not not fully silent, but close. Okay, yeah. Well, it's it's basically a silent film. I mean, there's a there's there's a little dialogue here and there. There's some sound effects, but a very sparing use of them. And he sings a song in, uh, towards the end of it too. He does this the gibberish song at the end, but it's basically a silent film, and it's a film I'll never play to, and that's fine. Oh. Well, oh, go because it has Chaplin's Chaplin, own well, score. Chaplin, yeah. His score for Modern Times is like a blueprint. Uh, especially for, for accompanying uh, Chaplin films. People, every once in a while, you see somebody is booked, oh, they, you know, I'm gonna, there's a show with Modern Times and so-and-so is going to play the organ to it. And then, of course, the Chaplin estate finds out and shuts the show down because you, you're not allowed to do that. Uh, you either have to run the, the film with the track that Chaplin recorded or hire an orchestra to play his music. Is it the same with City Lights? Yes, yeah, and okay. The Circus and Gold mm -hmm. Rush. Oh, wow. Um, they, they control the rights on those, and because they can, they are able to dictate what the accompaniment uh, is. So it's either Chaplin's score recorded or performed Play by, by Do you Robert. agree with that? Do you think that's a fair decision on their part? Well, I understand why they're doing it. The plus side is that it means that whenever you see, one, at least one of the, the features, when you see them, it's a prestige presentation with a full orchestra, mm. and you're hearing Mr. Chaplin's music. The downside is that the other films from the era, especially the comedies, circulate and get shown a great deal more with piano or organ accompaniment, or even a small ensemble like the Montalto Motion Picture Orchestra, that's five or six pieces. 
So that yeah. means that films like The Kid Brother and Seven Chances and Steamboat Bill Jr. and uh, Safety Last can be shown a lot more, but the only things that those same theaters can show are The Rink and The Pawn Shop and The Floor Walk. They're, as, they're great shorts, but it, you cannot include The Gold Rush in the same sort of presentation style. So, so it gets a lot less play, as it were. I mean, I'm thinking also in terms of back again, well, this is probably going back 30 years, maybe, already, when uh, they took Metropolis, the Fritz Lang film. And wasn't it Giorgio Moroder trying to yeah. do a modern-esque thing? I mean, it actually was one of the more famous silent films. It jumped the wall of time, and suddenly people were like, oh my gosh, there's a silent movie out. And people right. have heard of it and went to see it. And they're like, oh, it was, it was an event when uh, well, they that, were doing that's it. The, the advantage of you know, a contemporary or rock pop style of scoring for silent films. And I can understand that the chaplain say wanted to keep that sort of thing from happening. There are a lot of people who hate that, that kind of thing, but at the same time, it brings in an, a new audience. And it's not necessarily my cup of tea. I do uh, think it's, you know, anything that gets people to experience silent film for the first time is, is a good thing. I've met people at my shows who said, oh, I, I, the first time I went to a silent film, I saw it played with whatever, some rock band or whatever. Oh, yeah. And But I've not met people who said, you know, I saw a silent film once and there was a rock band playing and I never want to see a silent movie again. I've never experienced that. So it's all, it's all good. The downside to films not being shown is that they become less familiar. And this is, you know, while for decades, Harold Lloyd kept very tight control over how his films were presented, people did not know who he was. And it's taken a number of years of them now being available on DVD that everybody knows who he is again. You know, you can still show Safety Last to an audience who's never even heard of Harold Lloyd, but at least they know that picture of a guy hanging off of a clock. Right. The Gold Rush was shown in New York City a year or two ago at the New York Film Festival with an 18-piece orchestra. It had not been shown with live accompaniment in New York City for since 1997 or 1998. It was not easy for them to sell tickets to it because they were charging concert prices. Oh. And so I know that uh, it's difficult. It, the, the, the other tricky part is if you're insisting on an orchestra, that, that's great. Believe me, when you see the Gold Rush with an orchestra, it's really quite something. But the, the tr it becomes very, very expensive to mount. Forget about the rights and uh, all that stuff, but to hire an orchestra, a professional orchestra to rehearse and perform. Yeah, you have to pay these union people. I mean, I, I wouldn't know how you could even break even on something like I'm that. I'm not really sure how that, how that works. But the thing is, at least the films are available uh, on DVD and the Chaplin films that they're gradually coming out in even better releases uh, on Criterion. Oh, yeah. And be seen, and perhaps at some point the, the rules about the Chaplin films may, may change. But I'm sure to... next year is a big, the big Chaplin centennial and there'll be a lot of screenings, I'm quite sure. I guess the Chaplin estate does keep a tight hold because wouldn't most of these things be in public domain at this point? Well, which is a whole other kettle of fish as far as that's the another, I mean, are shown. That's a, yeah. whole other, that's a whole other thing. Basically, anything from 1923 onward, with a number of exceptions, is still under copyright thanks to the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act that was signed into law in 1998. All silent films should be in the public domain at this point if it were not for the Sonny mm. Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. So between that and uh, the GATT Treaty that, that went into effect in the mid-90s, protecting European copyright holders, and Chaplin being a British citizen, never becoming a U.S. Oh. citizen, uh, falls under that category. It's tricky, but it, it's just really a matter of learning, you know, what's PD, what's not, what's licensable, and that, and that sort of thing. I don't think you ever got to, um, to answer the question, though, of your favorite film or two. Oh, well, I mentioned Modern Times, and we got off on Oh, right, right, I'm sorry, yeah. Music, Modern... Although... Like, like I said, Modern Times should always be shown with the track that's, that's on it because it's, it, you, you can't improve on it. Um, Modern Times, and then there's a number of other films that uh, I, I can't name them because there's, there's, there's quite a number of them. There's people whose work I like, and there's certain films I know that if I'm going to play for them, I, I look forward to it. Are there people who are, you mentioned Griffiths. Uh, Raymond Griffiths. Raymond Griffiths. Griffith. Are there other silent film stars either in comedy or drama as well that we don't know even people who kind of know silent film really don't know enough about either because their work wasn't that available way back when or 
they're just not Chaplain Keaton, Lord Lloyd Langdon. And oh so yeah, there's plenty of people who such know, like as that. Constance Talmadge is a, mm-hmm. a an actress and comedian who every time I show one of her films somewhere, the the audience reaction is not only fantastic; they fall in love with her. But everybody goes, "How come I never heard of her before?" And she worked you know, throughout the entire silent era and. Um, a great many of her films do survive. They just don't circulate. And the, uh, Kino put out a DVD of two of her films uh, a few years ago. So people are starting to discover her. There are comedians like Marcel Perez, who are still uncovering uh, films Ooh. because so many of them are lost, who, like Max Linder, was working from the beginning of cinema, you know, initially in Italy and then France and then came here and worked almost all the way through the silent era here in the States. It was a very clever, creative, and funny comedian. And so it, people just don't know his name or his work. People like Charlie Chase and Lloyd Hamilton. And Those I used to see on, on public TV every once in a while. Those would even pop up on the Joe Franklin show. Sure. Of all things. You, mean, you would find an old Lloyd B. Hamilton short. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, well, cool. The reason a lot of those things survive, and I'll use this as a segue to my, <laughs> my DVD project, is that a oh, lot yeah. of those films were made available in 16 millimeter prints for the home home movie market in the 20s, 30s, and 40s for rentals, like Netflix, for the Art Deco era. And you could rent these things and show them at, in your home and at birthday parties or whatever, and then you would send it back to the Codescope Library or Home Film Libraries or the Universal Show at Home Library. And these prints survive, whereas a lot of the 35 millimeter prints do not. It's a term I've come up with, I call these films accidentally preserved because these 60 millimeter prints do survive and turn up and they're eminently projectable and, and because they were made in the 20s and 30s from original 35 millimeter prints, they're incredibly sharp hmm. and they look great. I've accumulated a number of these over the years. Actually, last fall I did a Kickstarter project to transfer and score and release films from my own collection that were either rare or lost on DVD and now on YouTube. And the Kickstarter was a, a big success. Yeah, how much I, did you need and how much did you get? I was trying to raise $3,600 and I raised $4,600. Sweet. And uh, the DVD was released in June. We got a very nice write-up from the New York Times and some other press, including this radio broadcaster listening to. Um, <laughs> sale between uh, royalties from sales on Amazon and sales at shows and the extra money uh, left over from the first project, uh, a, vo- a second volume has already been funded. You can buy Accidentally Preserved on, on Amazon. So I'm starting to release the films once a week on YouTube as well. So if you go to my channel, you can find it there. But that's how films like you know, Lloyd Hamilton comedies and Lupino Lane comedies mostly survive in 16 millimeter. And these things turn up on eBay and flea markets and attics and basements and stuff like that. And so are there still being these major discoveries. I mean, I remember uh, when I first started really getting into silent film and reading about them, it was always, well, this film was lost and half this person's career is gone and that two-reeler is is gone. Because as we move further and further away from that era, I would assume it's more and more rare for things to turn up. But have Um, there been... I think that as much as you would think that, it does seem that things turn up every year. Hmm. And in, in a variety of form, you know, there was a big press story a, a few years ago about a film curator who was on honeymoon in, in New Zealand and went to the New Zealand archives and said, do you have any American silent films? And it turns out there's quite a, a lot of stuff there that has since been repatriated. So there's that, and there's the, the Pola Negri film, The Spanish Dancer, which only survived in choppy or fragmented form, which turned up and was restored by the I Film Institute in the Netherlands, and has been shown in a few festivals. So there are people like Serge Bromberg in France who turns up stuff all the time. And there are plenty of collectors who have collections of varying sizes of these rare and lost films in 16 millimeter from these old prints who you just don't know that they have them because there are film collectors who will loan you prints and are happy to show films, and there are film collectors who have a huge collection and they won't tell you what they have, and the only way you can see it is if you go to their house. So there may be things that are lost or rare, but you just can't see them. And it all depends on how willing a a collector may be. And and there are things that just turn up. One of the great stories like that, you know, there's a Mabel Norman feature called Head Over Heels. 
that turned up seven or eight years ago. Hmm. And it was from her the time she was at Goldwyn. She was for like three years at, uh, making features for Goldwyn after she left the Senate and made like 18 features that just ground them out to keep her on the screen, and most of them are missing. But so this one... A, guy who has a camera shop in Massachusetts was helping his dad move out of his house and they go into the basement and what's the, what are these cans? Oh, well these cans of film were in the basement when I moved into the house. So the guy looks at them and contacts Kodak Motion Picture Film. As it turns out, the person he contacted is married to a friend of mine who's a film historian and it's, he, would they showed him frame scans or pictures of it. They said, oh my God, it's a lost Mabel Norman film. What was amazing is that the the film was almost in excellent condition. There's some of the, the heads and tails of reels are missing, but right, yeah. it, it's been preserved, and it, there's a print of the Library of Congress. So things just turn up, and this is the way the, the footage of Metropolis that turned up in Argentina. There was a guy who had the original print held onto it and held onto it, and it was starting to go, so he made a 15-millimeter print so he could keep watching it. And he just had it. There are things that, that people don't realize that they have that are rare that well, the great so thing the also... The right person asks, and they'll, oh, oh, you were looking for this? I didn't know it was missing. You know, that, that happens, too. So there, there is a lot of silent film missing and mm, oh, maybe yeah. completely lost. At the same time, things turn up every year, and you, may, you, you, know, you never know where you're going to find it. A friend of mine was not looking for film, just poking him out at a big open flea market and opened a steamer trunk, and there was a whole bunch of films and bought a bunch of them. Yeah. But later, finally... Threaded, got around to watching some of the stuff, and one of them turned out to be an, a Keystone film that Chaplin makes a cameo in that nobody knew was, <gasps> was uh, new to look for. We didn't even know it was lost. Wait, whoa, 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 what movie? What really? Yeah, and this is this is a few years ago. A film called The Thief Catcher, and Chaplin turns up for like a minute and a half as a policeman, and then disappears. And and uh, it, that's enormous. That's uh, he's not in in Tramp. Uh, costume. He's just, no, this is early. Yeah. This is kind of early on. A case. Like nineteen thirteen. Yeah. This is a film that was copied to sixteen millimeter for the home home rental market and forgotten about. And so these things can turn up. Nitrate prints turn up in in archives all over the place. Well, how do you so, save a nitrate? I mean, that that's the one we always that uh, the AFI put the fear of God into everybody about of the nitrate prints. That well, you stand near a match and the whole thing goes up in, in yeah, flames. Yeah, don't. Don't store them next to your fireplace in the winter, but you know nitrate film is, when cared for well, uh, is still eminently usable. I mean, there were those films that turned up in England, the Mitchell and Kenyon films that were made in the 1890s, and yes, some of them were decomposed and useless, but some of them looked absolutely gorgeous and, and looked as good as they did when they were first shown. And of course, the exciting thing I think about the whole revolution in the way people watch and download and movies is that once you take even one lost film and digitize it, it's no longer lost. And not only that, it's not, in, you know, you put it on YouTube and suddenly a film that was lost is now available to 180 million people. Well, this is the whole idea behind my Accidentally Preserved project. You know, some of the things I, I posted online as a pilot, sort of as a test, uh, last summer have now you know, like the, the highest views as one short has been has 14,000 views and this is a lost comedy short and in some cases some of the films that I, I have that I've posted that are not only lost but miss are unidentified people will post comments and help me figure out what I have uh, mm. one of the films on my DVD is made about and I believe by the Elgin National Watch Company it's a 20 minute industrial on the making of an Elgin pocket watch you see the factory and you see every stage of making the watch. You see the Elgin Observatory. I've contacted two antique watch people, experts, and neither of them has even heard of the film. And there's no credits. Mm -hmm. So by, by putting it on YouTube, who knows who's going to see it and, and know something about this thing. And, and also just in terms of history, I mean, there may be a lot of people who would find this very interesting in terms of not only watchmaking, but the history of Elgin, Illinois. I mean, uh, mm. I, I don't know if the building still stands or if the observatory is still there, but here's this gorgeous print from 1931, we figure, documenting the entire factory. To wrap up our conversation, yeah. really cool conversation with Ben sure. Modell, but, but still I'm not quite done because sure. this is so exciting for me. Um, I want to ask, uh, first of all, none of my business, but how big is your collection? If you don't mind my ass, how many films do you have? Um, I don't, I would say 
the the rare things I have about twenty, mm-hmm. and the rest of the things is comedy shorts, maybe another thirty or forty shorts. Well, this but doesn't count. I don't have a huge huge huh. film collection. This is a rather small, modest collection compared to a lot of the people I know. These are things that you physically have, you know, as prints, either sixteen yeah. or thirty-five. Well, I'm not talking then about. Well, sure, you have on DVD. You know, two thousand silent films. I assume that you know. No, 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 I don't. I don't collect stuff on DVD. Yeah, no, these are these are motion picture films, and I have sixteen millimeter projector here, and yeah, these are real actual films. Which is your prized possession of them? Oh, um, I don't know if there, that there's one, but I would say anything that I have that's a a, a codoscope, meaning it was printed by the codoscope library in the twenties or thirties. You know, I have a couple of Chaplin shorts that are printed in the late 1920s, and they're just really, really, really sharp and rather complete. Um, but aren't you afraid to... But that's the thing. If it's a Chaplin short, that's available in a lot of different forms and places. Aren't you just afraid to even run that through a projector? Wouldn't you just kind of let it be? No, no, no. This is the thing is, you know, you leave a film in a can for decades, and that's what that's where vinegar syndrome starts to kick in. You know, uh, running a film through a projector and airing it out... Uh, that way is one of the best things for it. Really? Oh my god. At least in terms of 16 millimeter safety film, yes. Uh, especially an older print that may have decompositional issues. You know, airing it out is, is a good thing. Huh. Like I said, these films are, are eminently projectable. There may be some slight shrinkage, but that's not, not a, big, a big issue. <laughs> so, As I get older, that happens to me too. What can I tell you? Yeah, ex- exactly. When you turn up something that's, that's a lost film, and it's an old print from the 20s or 30s like that, it gets to be fun. Yeah, I, I guess in terms of... Yeah, sure. I don't know about prized possessions, but, you know, wow, I can't believe I found this lost film because uh, it was mislabeled on eBay, and I recognized the, the actor from the frame grabs and got it for $18. The, those little stories are, are, are kind of fun, and you never know who's going to turn up something. Now, can I ask also, Ben Modell, and this is really a question that, that is honestly just for me, because I don't think anybody else in the world <laughs> would care, but I've been so incredibly curious, because when I started watching silent films back on Channel 13, and what I watched over and over again were the Chaplin and Keaton shorts, and they were accompanied, I don't think it was William Perry, because yeah. he did some of the later stuff in the longer films. I think it, it was the Paul Killiam collection. Yeah. Now, was he the pianist, or who was the pianist on those? Um. Uh, yeah, for the most part, those were those were Paul Killian uh, productions, and he used uh, Bill Perry. I think, although I would say that I know Bill Perry got into film accompaniment, if I'm not mistaken, around 1968 or 69, where he started playing in MoMA. So anything that Killian had a, a Killian edition from before then might have used somebody else. I know he did work with some other accompanist on uh, organ, like John Murray and Lee Irwin. No, no, it wasn't, because I'm trying to, I, I would love to track down if they ever did a CD or an album of them, because they would, what happened was they would kind of play the same themes, or about five or six melodies, that huh? would keep recurring when they would do these shorts, and they were, it was hey. just piano, it was not, there was no orchestra, there was no organ. Okay, I think I know what you're talking about. There was a show that, that aired, I think only for a few weeks, but I'm sure they just repeated the films, that a guy named Herb Graff put together from his collection. Herb Graff and he worked, did the show together with Walter Kerr and Bill Everson. And I remember seeing these, mostly obscure comedy shorts, and there was this record that I kept hearing, like the same four or five themes yeah. over. That is a record called um, Musical Moods from the Moving, Moving Pictures, or, or the Silent Films and also a record called Music for Silent Comedies. Those two LPs were recorded in 67 by Arthur Kleiner, who was MoMA's first film accompanist. I have both of them. Oh, my God. That's what you're hearing. Because I found those records years and years ago, and I listened to it, and I was like, oh, my God, that's what I was hearing on the old Herb Graff show. So it's musical moods for the silent films or uh, music for silent comedies on, like, Grand Award or Golden Crest Records, a small label. And those were never put on CD, to your knowledge, or anything? No, like they, they've never been re-released. And I'm sure the original master tapes don't exist, and they, they, I've never found a, a vinyl copy that wasn't full of surface noise. So oh, sure. yeah. um, <laughs> you, you'd have to do a, a good deal of, of cleanup on it to, to re-release it. But that's what you're hearing. Those records 
were a mix of ragtime and uh, mood music uh, com- written and published for film accompaniment in the 20s and music that Kleiner himself uh, had composed. And he had started at MoMA when they started showing silent films. He had been one of Balanchine's accompanists and they hired him and he was playing for films for close to about 30 years until he retired and that, that's, who, that's what that was. I'm so glad I asked you that question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh my God, that, uh, I mean, 40 years, I was watching this when I was seven years old. So it's just uh, being able to have that question answered, even if I can't find the bloody albums on eBay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> ben Modell here on Dave's Gone By. And, you know, we've been talking, talking about the film and the preservation and certainly the, uh, the accidentally preserved project. First of all, tell us where people can, your website would be? Go to accidentallypreserved.com. You can find film notes by Steve Massa, a full filmography of what's on the DVD, as well as a, a link to buy the DVD on Amazon. Uh, my own website is silentfilmmusic.com uh, that, w- that has background information about me as well as my performing schedule. You can follow me on Twitter at, at silentfilmmusic. And um, on your the other page. project I want to plug in, in case you don't already know about it, is that I am the programmer and curator of two DVD box sets of Ernie Kovacs television programs. They came out through a company called Shout Factory uh, in the last few years, and it's the first set is six DVDs, and the second set is three DVDs. And if you like Ernie Kovacs, um, it's basically soup to nuts, everything that's worth showing from his earliest days in 1951 in Philadelphia all the way through his very last program. uh, Coming out in November, is a, a DVD box set of the Edie Adams television show that she did after Ernie uh, died, and, and from 1962 to 1964. These are all brand new digital transfers off the original two-inch tapes, and these shows have not been seen since they aired in 1962 and 1964. The yeah. Ernie Kovacs collection, Volume 1 and 2, and the set that's coming out in November, but you can pre-order it, called Here's Edie, the Edie Adams television shows. How did you get involved with that? Did you know E.E. Adams, or were you... Uh, yes. In 1996, I put up a fan website for Ernie Kovacs, and three months later, she sent me an email. Huh. And I got to know her by phone and email, and then met her at a conference in 2004, and we were, we were you know, in touch for many years until she passed away in 2008, and I've been in touch with her son from her second marriage, Josh Mills, who's... You know, controlling the the collection, the the writer, sure. sort of the archivist for the collection now, and he's really gotten behind getting these things out and making them available, which has been great. And so your your tasks with that, since it was not silent film, is just going through them. What it was your task in getting these DVDs out? Well, the, my task was going through the material and being familiar with the shows and watching all of them and making selections about well, this this is the best transfer that exists, or oh, yeah boy, that show's kind of a clunker, let's not put that on the set. At the same time, there were things that I discovered going through the archive where a lot of stuff had been mislabeled, and I would discover something like um, the original 16mm material on a film Kovacs made in 53 called The, the Mysterious Knockworth. And I'd go, oh my God, I found this. Uh, discovering the original master tapes for an unreleased Percy Dove tonsils record that Ernie recorded for a, a small uh, uh, independent label there were creative differences and he pulled the tape and bought the rights back and then just held on to it and i i knew it existed it was never released and i found it in the collection and josh found a, a wonderful label uh, omnivore records who uh, among other things puts out a lot of albums that were recorded and shelved but mm. perfectly released and so this record Percy Dove Tonsils Speak uh, was released last year, and you can buy it on CD, you can download it, you can also buy it on limited edition lavender vinyl. <laughs> and we found Ernie's li- uh, draft of his liner notes. I mean, I wrote liner notes for the LP, and the mu- the tape that survives is unmixed, unedited, and there's no music under it. And at the very end of the, the raw tape, Ernie says to the engineer, well, we put uh, 88 bars of music in between each one, and we'll, you know, we'll come out even. <laughs> so we knew, okay, he probably wanted music, so I wound up scoring, uh, doing underscore for the entire album. Oh, that's so cool. It's, it's called what, Percy Dove Tonsils what? Unreleased? Or? Percy Dove Tonsils Speaks, but Speaks. with a TH. 
Oh, because he was right. And yeah. that's available on, I think, iTunes, but definitely, again, if you go to Amazon or go to the website for Omnivore Records, you can buy it. Uh, and if you buy the, the LP, uh, it comes with a download card, so the bonus tracks that are not part of the album, you can still download them. Way, way, oh my God. That, you know, I, I envy, in a lot of ways, so much of what you get to do with your life. I mean, to sort through Kovacs material, score it, release it, work with these people, and then, of course, all this, the things that you do with film and silent film. Yes. I guess the last question for Ben Modell would be, when are you playing next in either Colorado or, or the tri-state area? When are you accompanying stuff next that people can see? Okay, well, I, I've never played in Colorado, so if, uh, any, if you can hear the sound of my voice, uh, I'd love to come out and play out there. But if, if by the tri-state area you mean New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, at the Hamilton Theater in Hamilton, New York, near uh, Colgate College. It'll be my 10th year doing a show there. We're showing Steamboat Bill Jr. Uh -huh. That's August 24th, Saturday. And I will be playing for Eric Von Stroheim's Queen Kelly, starring Gloria Swanson. It's the film you see Norma Desmond watch in Sunset Boulevard. And I'll be playing for that at the Cinema Arts Center in Huntington, New York, where we show silent movies once a month year-round. And then in September, I will be at the Silent Film Days Festival in Tromsø, Norway. Wow. Get the month. Uh, it'll be my eighth year there. Why, do I, why have I heard of Tromsø before? It, something's in Tromsø, other than you. There's no reason for me to have heard of Tromsø, Norway, but I have. Okay. There's no big museum or something there that I'm forgetting well, there's, about. There's, there's a, the Polar Institute is there, and, and there's a, a huge international film festival held there every year in January. Maybe that's it. This, this, this Silent Film Days is an offshoot of that. And then in September at MoMA, I will be co-curating and accompanying Cruel and Unusual Comedy. That's right. I will be at the Fall Cinecation in Maslin, Ohio. Hmm. Uh, but basically, follow me on Twitter or go to my website. And that's where you can find my performance schedule. I, I play, and this is what I do full time, I, between performances and scoring stuff for DVDs. I think that's fabulous. And, and I think it's been just a delight to talk with Ben Modell. Please go, if nothing else, start with his website and then branch out from there. Silentfilmmusic.com. Ben Modell. Uh, I, I wish I'd known you better back at NYU, but I'm <laughs> glad I'm getting to know you now, I gotta tell you. Who, who knew I was gonna wind up doing this? I, well, well, you didn't become a filmmaker. Was, was um, I, not, yeah. not, well, I'm, I'm getting back into it, and that's a whole other conversation I could talk to you about my, the feature I made 20-something years ago, but that's another, that's another... To be continued. To we'll be do continued, it. continued, but mainly check me out on my website and do uh, pick up Accidentally Preserved at Amazon.com, uh, proceeds from sales go toward releasing more DVDs or rare, rare silent films. And I, I can't think of a more deserving place for them to go. Thank you, Ben Modell.